2022 tornado edition. Uh, let me make sure this is live. Perfect. Okay, so we are um, we are pressing forward despite uh, storms happening around us. We're going to try to do this the best we can. Um, currently, we have weather heading towards Starkville, so we may have to break in the moment here. But uh, uh, what we will do is try to press forward regardless. It looks like we have three of the teams online right now, but uh, for the sake of pressing forward, we're going to go ahead and get started. So tonight we start off with the best brand competition. And uh, these teams are working on new ideas that have the potential to be a brand that can be recognizable um, all across the country. So that's our, that's our team's goals tonight. We're joined by three fantastic judges who have a tough, tough decision ahead of them with uh, some, some great entrepreneurs. Of course, the whole event couldn't happen. We've had uh, a total of eight competitions this week that will happen and 33 teams competing for a total of nearly $40,000 in prize money that wouldn't happen without some amazing sponsors. We hope you'll check out our website, ecenter.msstate.edu slash summit and see those great sponsors, Bank Telesystems, J5, Global, uh, Read Food Technology and Industry Services Co. who underwrite this event and help fund next generation ideas here at Mississippi State. So moving on to our judges, um, judges, if you would, please turn on your camera and join us if you are able. We've got uh, Mr. Tony Jeff. Uh, uh, Mr. Tony Jeff is CEO of Innovate Mississippi, an organization down based out of Jackson who uh, also was dealing with some weather earlier. And their organization helps support high growth entrepreneurs all across the state of Mississippi. Uh, so Tony, welcome tonight. Thank you for having me. Next up, we have Miss Anna Barker. Anna is um, uh, Anna is co-founder of Glow and Glow Pals here, based in Starkville, Mississippi. Um, she uh, led the development of the now uh, international Glow Pals brand that is that has built partnerships with uh, name brands like Sesame Street and is in retailers feels like everywhere. Um, their team of um, uh, their, their team is based here in Starkville, Mississippi, and the company actually won eWeek in 2015. Uh, so teams that are on the call tonight, be aware that you're, uh, you can be there in just a few years and a whole, whole, whole lot of hard work. Um, so, so keep that in mind. Anna, thanks for joining us tonight. I think you're muted there. Uh, can you hear me now? We can. Two and a half years in, you would think that we ha would have this Zoom thing down. So sorry about that. Um, but thank you, so, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to hear all of your pitches, and uh, you're all really great sports for still showing up and um, and doing this with all the weather coming this way and all the other things you have going on. So thank you again for having me. Thanks, Anna. And last but certainly not least, Mr. Jonathan Williams is joining us. From, you know, I don't really know where because Jonathan is such an international traveler uh, and, a, and a, a man, myth, and legend. But uh, Jonathan started the brand uh, Reality Digital that does brand development for companies all over the country now, many notable here in Mississippi, and is our go to source for all things web. So, Jonathan, welcome. Appreciate you joining us. Hey. Yeah, absolutely. I'm in Boston right now, Eric. So, um, <laughs> I appreciate you having me on. It's great to be here. Glad to have you. Glad yeah. to have you. Okay. Well, we will dive right into the pitches. A few logistical notes. So first of all, um, presenters, if you would, please mute your mic until it's your turn to present. Um, each presenter will have five minutes to give a presentation and then three minutes of Q&A from the judges. Q&A is reserved just for the judges. And, um, and then we will move forward to there. We'll be awarding three prizes tonight, first, second, and third, as well as a People's Choice Award. So those of you joining us uh, via the internet, be sure to vote in the chat window of YouTube. Uh, that's how we'll be collecting People's Choice votes tonight. So with that, we our first presenter 
is going to be Ms. Brooke Bain. So Brooke, when you're ready, feel free to share your screen. And Brooke, are you with us there? Yes, just one second. Sure, take your time. All right. Here we go. Um, hi, my name is Brooke Bain. I'm a medical laboratory scientist major here at MSU, and I own Brooks Botanicals. Um, we are a mail order business selling exotic house plants, and we ship across the United States year round. Right. Um, there is so much opportunity in this market. Um, 66% of consumers here in the United States own at least one house plant. So that's a lot of people. Um, when I started off as a hobbyist and collector years ago, I noticed a huge gap in the market. I wanted to collect and grow these rare elusive plants, but I had nowhere to buy them from domestically here in the United States. So throughout through my connections as a hobbyist, I um, started importing uh, the plants myself from countries like Indonesia, Ecuador, and Germany. And after years of collecting, trading, and selling on a small scale, I decided to um, turn it into a business. And, um, you know, a lot of collectors here in the United States. Um, they don't have the same, uh, like resources that I do, like with sourcing and international shipping, uh, with plants is also, um, not the easiest thing. And you, there's also rehabbing involved. So it's a lot easier, you know, if customers can directly, um, you know, buy from a seller here in the United States. Um, so my solution to this opportunity is to sell my products on a safe, secure platform. And right now I primarily sell on Etsy. I offer a wide variety of plants from carnivorous plants that grow in Indonesia, all the way to uh, philodendron, which are more foliage type plants. And those come from Ecuador. My customers can expect fast and hassle-free shipping, so they do not have to worry about the plants in transit. And after I import the plants, I acclimate them for at least two months here to ensure that they're ready for their new home. And sometimes plants, um, after you know, they're shipped from a different country, they do take some time to kind of rebound and to, to get back in um, a good state. So. I keep them here until they're healthy and ready for their new home. So how it works. Um, as I previously stated, I primarily sell on Etsy. Um, I have lots of different options for shipping. Um, they can choose what carrier they prefer and uh, what speed uh, they would like it shipped at. And then since plants are considered you know, perishable items, uh, special considerations have to be taken uh, when shipping in the elements. So for cold weather shipping, which is what we're dealing with right now, um, I use 72 hour heat packs and thermal packaging. And so far I've successfully uh, shipped plants to Alaska in negative degree weather. And then there's also some slight problems with hot weather as well. So there's cool packs and you can also use insulated boxes. And then also the processing time um, is fairly quick. I try to um, get the plants out in one or two business days. 
Um, so the financial model. Um, so like I said, I sell on Etsy. Um, Etsy's fees are uh, 20 cents a listing plus 5% of the total sale, as well as 3% of the total sale plus 25 cents for the Etsy payment. So summed up, that's about 45 cents plus 8%. And you can see here um, my stats for this year, like how much I've um, paid up with shipping um, and all the fees and marketing. Uh, so recently I've been um, kind of experimenting with the marketing. And here is like, um, an example of the unit economics. Uh, and you can see, um, I guess my kind of point of view from Etsy. So the revenue really depends on what plant is being sold. Um, you know, I sell plants all from $50 all the way to, you know, $700 or above. Um, so like I said, on this one. That don't have to be our time there, Brooke, but uh, mm -hmm. we will move into judges Q and A now. So judges, we have three minutes. Hi, Brooke. Uh, you were telling me about how um, this first started. Uh, you, you mentioned that it first started kind of as a hobby and you mm -hmm. were actually just sourcing them really for like for yourself. How did you start sourcing and where did you find suppliers? Mm -hmm. um, kind of through like fellow collectors. Um, you know, we're at the beginning, it was a really tight knit community and we all kind of knew each other and through them. Um, for more experienced growers, I was um, able to learn, you know, like who to go to for these plants and everything like that. Mm -hmm. Have you seen any supply chain issues with them? I imagine, uh, I mean, since everyone has this being such a specialty thing and you said it takes a lot of care to get it to you um, because obviously these plants are really delicate and temperature sensitive. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you seen any supply chain issues uh, since because of the pandemic? Mm -hmm. Um, so with COVID, you know, shipping is a little bit delayed, but um, I know some have experienced, you know, issues with their plants, like arriving not in the best state, but um, so far, um, mine has done pretty well. I pay for really uh, fast shipping, so I think that also plays a role on it. Um, yeah. So I couldn't read this slide. How many have you sold? How many plants have you sold? Um, I think so far this year, I've sold um, over 100 this year. Um, in okay. total, um, probably from two to 300. And then, sorry to go fast, but the, aren't, aren't there regulatory issues of shipping plants? into different states and how do you manage that process when mm -hmm. you get orders? Yeah, so like I'm officially uh, like starting my business this year and I'm in the process of getting my um, like nursery license. So that will, um, the USDA will have to come and inspect and um, then I will be able to ship in uh, the different states. Um, so I'm in the process of that right now. How much is it per plant on average, like your average order size? My average order size? Um, I'd have to look. I would say probably, um, probably around like 75 to like $100. Mm -hmm. Wow. It so varies. Wow. So what was your total revenue from those? You said um, in total, I know you said 100 orders this year, but two to 300 um, in total. Do you have your total revenue number? I didn't see that uh, either. And you might have had it in your slides and I missed it. Yeah. Um, so right here, so far total this year, um, I've made 7,278. And most of that... Um, I mostly propagate from my own plants. I do, um, I do sometimes import and directly sell those, but most of the time I, um, 
you know, I'm propagating for my own collection and I've had these plants for a while. So. One, one more quick question. I'm so sorry to, to ask again. The, the uh, 7,200 approximately that you've earned, you said this year. So is that for 2022 or in the last 12 months? Um, that's since January this, this year. So from January uh, to March. That's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. That'll have to be our last question. Thank you. Good job, Brooke. Thank you, guys. All right. And next up, we have Mr. Chris Knowles with the Mississippi Hat Co. Chris, whenever you're ready, feel free to unmute, share your screen and camera. All right. Let me share this screen. One second. All right, can you all hear me? And can you see the screen? I uh, don't see your screen shared yet. Okay, let me try again. Okay, how about now? We got it now, yes, sir. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Chris Knowles, and my company is the Mississippi Hat Company. Uh, we offer custom couture high-end millinery, um, and we're based here in Starkville, Mississippi. So the problem when I started my hat company, there were no designers and no hat companies in Mississippi. They gave beautiful, beautiful Southern women, women hats here in Mississippi. Um, a lot of my clients had to shop in New York, Atlanta, Texas, and California in order to get hats, and I wanted something that represented the state well and represented Mississippi, you know, as a whole well. And that wasn't really um, charging them a crazy ton of money extra just to get something from out of state. And so my solution, I came up with Mississippi Hat Company. We create custom, youthful and affordable hats of all different styles, all different ranges, which I will show you some of um, coming up in a slideshow. So our ideal customer for our for my business is uh, Kojic women, uh, young women, Kentucky Derby wives, um, church women, and uh, ages 18 through 20 was a target focus for my company um, just because I wanted to push that young women can wear hats too. And as you see here, uh, this is a young lady named Ashley Barnes, and she's from Grenada, Mississippi, and she was a Sunday Best contestant on BET wearing one of my hats there at a memorial service, and I also made hats for this group right here, the Clark Sisters, um, for memorial service. And they're a lifetime uh, Grammy-winning uh, group. Uh, they've been on Lifetime, had a documentary there, um, well-known gospel group, um, also featured on BET. And I also sell many of my hats at the Church of God in Christ uh, Holy Convocation, which is a big convention with thousands on thousands of people there. Um, and held, it was held in St. Louis right here as pictured, and it's, will, it will be in Memphis uh, coming up this year and continuing it will be in Memphis. Sales tracking, and I also set up at different conventions, which we have a lot of. I'm pretty much, I've been at a convention about every week now, starting in March. And we have conventions where we set up at and we showcase our products and social media has has helped me grow my business tremendously. Um, most of my posts get well over a thousand without any ad campaigns. And uh, I have a lot of people sharing. Um, many of my posts get 10,000 or more views um, in a quick time span. Um, I do a lot of collaboration with different designers. Uh, Robert Craig, he's the designer for the Clark Sisters and many other celebrities as well as stylist Jay Bolin he designs for a lot of different celebrities. So I do a lot of collaborations with them to help get my work out there and help get my brand to uh, get in some of that, uh, uh, I would say, exposure. My competitive advantage is that uh, I offer things that are unique and my prices are below some computer prices. I do not solely base my competitive advantage on price, but I do for a great quality product uh, in comparison to some of the other ones. As you see, the uh, Derby Girls, 
uh, they have their hats here and there. So like 600, 400, 600. And my pricing of my hats with small hats run from 150 to 175 to 250 to 325. And I profit at least $125 to $235 per hat. Um, and oftentimes it's much more than that. Uh, let me get back to that slide. Expansion, as you can possibly to expand into um, some brick and mortar locations here in, um, in Tupelo. I've been viewing spaces in the Barnes Crossing Mall, and that was recently. I also am working on a cowboy collection. Um, here, if I do a brick and mortar location, I know I have to diversify my style of hats. And so I'm working on these cowboy styles so I can, you know, provide Southern gentlemen with hats that cater to the market here in Mississippi, as well as fedora styles as well. Um, that's something I've been doing now a while, but I'm gonna have a signature uh, fedora line come out as well. And to give a bit more insight on my company, I wanna show you um, here, I wanna show you a bit of what it's like behind the scenes. Can you all see me good here? Here is one hat that I'm working on. Um, making sure, can you all still see me? We can. Okay. This is one hat I'm working on here. It's a special hat. Uh, this is a Buckram base. Uh, I outsource manufacturing my bases. And this is what I'm working on as we're speaking. This one is very special to me because I've been asked to make this one for a loved one that recently passed um, last week. The services this Saturday's hat um, for her to wear in her service. She was very dear to me. So this one is very special. And as you can see here, I'm beating it and stoning it completely, but I'm leaving the back open. So as it lays in the um, casket, it still has the design showing here. And it's just behind the scenes of kind of what I do when I'm making it. And I use various stones and beads to embellish different hats. And uh, this kind of similar design as to what this hat will look like here as I complete it. Um, somewhat elaborate design here for this hat. We've sold hats now all over the United States. I started here in Mississippi. I now sell hats in New York, Cal to, Cal to California, pretty much all over the United States now. Um, uh, we also, we've had some people reach out from different uh, other countries. Um, Canada, people from Canada have reached out and we ship stuff from London and all different places here, uh, right out of Mississippi. So. Want to have my business do something that was great and to uh, show my um, Mississippi and represent Mississippi well and young entrepreneurs. And that'll have to be time. Thanks, Chris. All right, we'll move into QA now. Three minutes. Chris, hey, Chris I'm so I'm glad I'm... to see you again. Oh, sorry, yes. Tony. No, go, go, <laughs> no, go in. Yeah, I'm so glad you're back. That's so awesome. All the, uh, I mean, we were so impressed with you last year, but all the wonderful progress you've had uh, over the last year. I'm so glad to see you return. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask really quickly, and sorry to, uh, sorry I jumped in there on you, Tony. I was going to ask. Um, I know that you did really well during this round last year, and were able to win um, some of the funding as one of the prizes. What did you end up doing with the money that you were granted last year? So last year I used the monies um, heavily to get some new products in and get some new, um, a lot of different embellishment products, um, supplies to start new designs to really help differentiate me from other hat designers. So I was able to get a lot of new uh, hat shapes in that are kind of different. Here's one actually right here. This is a special fabric that no one else has that's sewn it, sewn it to this bad uh, sets and I'm sorry. So I was able to get some of that stuff in. I was able to also get more hats in to sell at conventions. Um, so that was one of the biggest things. And also I was able to work on some more promotional products uh, to get some more promotional. I use fans and different things to give at churches. Instead of business cards, I would give the ladies a church fan with a different hats <sighs> and my business information on them. That's a great idea. Thank you. So Chris, um, in terms of, is there, how do you see yourself being able to scale a custom business like this? And are all of them truly custom or are you repeating sales of similar designs? How, how does that work? You open it by saying it was custom or literally every single one of them custom? Okay, so yes, all of them are custom. I do duplicate designs though, just for expansion. 
Uh, I duplicate the designs for several hats. I've started to do that. Oftentimes I will, after doing a consultation, if that uh, client is flexible, I will offer, you know, customization options where I'll say, hey, to make it a bit different, how about we try this uh, fabric or this bow? So instead of doing a hard satin, we do a soft satin, change it up that way. But I do want to have my baseline of products. So as I grow, I have those um, signature products that people can come in and I always have my basics. So my basic black hats, my basic white hats, um, the simple designs like that um, in terms of getting, having that type of, you know, stuff in. So, but most of all of my products are custom, um, but I do have those where we can, you know, duplicate my basic ones. Do you have, um, besides you, does, do you have any other people helping you kind of create these, these hats or is it just kind of you doing it? Yes, I've had to bring in people. Um, the industry gets very stressful, especially around now. I'm moving into Easter season. Uh, literally overnight, I had about 20 people hit me up just from last night to now. And so I have um, different friends that are creatives that understand how to do the uh, work that's mm -hmm. done. And I also collaborate with different stylists that can give me ideas. I have this guy in Atlanta. I do a lot of collaboration with him. And he helps me with getting different designs in and helps me with being able to get products out as well. So, yes, I've had to bring some people on board to kind of help facilitate everything. Do you use a website at all for yes. onboarding mm -hmm. or is it kind of like through DMs and whatnot? Like, do you have like a like a form that people fill out like for scaling, you know, to get yes, it? As, so as, as, yeah. On my website, I have it where they can go and create a form. So on their form on the website, they will just go in, type in what they want, and we'll reach back out to them so we can offer that personalized feeling to them. But I am coming out where I will have a certain catalog for each season where that specific design is one that will be duplicated. And so um, say if this design is one of my fall collections, it'll be duplicated so they can just go buy it and it's ready to ship. And that's one of the biggest things um, that I'm looking to get funding for so I can have more stuff on hand and ready to ship uh, for those reasons. Sweet. That will have to be our last question. Chris, nice job. Appreciate your presentation. Thank you all. Thank you so much. And it looks like we will be moving to our last presenter here. So let's see. Miss Moore, whenever you're ready, feel free to share your slides. All righty. Can you guys see me? I have my camera on. I don't know if you guys can see me or not. We can. All right. Can you guys see my screen? We can, yes. All righty. Hi, everybody. My name is Callie Sia Moore, and I am the founder and CEO of Two Official Customs. We are a decorated streetwear brand that caters to those who appreciate variety, quality, and affordability in one-of-one -of -one custom wearable memory art. Before I get into my presentation here, I'm going to give a little backstory on what really allowed me to start this business. In 2019, unfortunately, one of my eldest brothers passed away, and like two years later, I received this book back. So in 2021, I got this book bag and I just wanted to be able to hold a part of him around always as well as make it look nice or something like I know that he would like. The opportunity, the United States decorated apparel market was from, this is a chart from 2018 until 2028. But if you look closely, you can notice a fall between 2019 and 2020 of about over a hundred million dollars. And that was when coronavirus hit, which leads me into our next, into our problem. Four of the main problems with the industry is supply fluctuate, fluctuates in international markets, meaning that a lot of business, businesses in the United States supply all of their products from countries like China and Cambodia and things like that. So when coronavirus hit those countries, it also hurt the United States markets. The second problem is there isn't enough variety to the product medium pair, meaning that some companies have a lot of products, but not many ways to customize them. Or some companies have a lot of ways to customize products, but not that many products. 
The third problem is both affordability and quality are super hard to find. It's like you can find a product that is really good quality, but it's really expensive, like brands like Louis Vuitton. Or you can find a product that's affordable, but the quality is not that good. Like you'll get a hoodie, but it'll be cheaply made. And the fourth problem is there isn't enough options that truly cater to the customer customer's needs, expectations, and overall experience. My solution to these problems is thinking through a customer mindset. Two official customs was built on a customer mindset and through a customer mindset. The second solution is we need to use different mediums which have nearly the same process. It'll be easier to apply those different processes to multiple products. And last, the last solution is we need to supply products through the American host through American wholesale distributors, meaning we just supply products within the country. That way we don't have to worry about those international markets so so close to the startup of the business. Which leads us into the customer experience. First, customers are able to order from our website. They can either, you know, go look through our catalog, select the product, whatever product they want. They can, select, they can upload their own images and they can select from our broad patch and airbrush font options. At the bottom here, I don't know if you guys can see me like, Moving over the picture at the bottom, customers can set up consultations, meaning that they can set up a call between me and them where they can send in their own apparel, whether it be a hoodie or a backpack like mine, or even shoes. That bring then we will bring their ideas to life. As soon as we get their, as soon as we get their order, we instantly start working on it from that moment that we get the um the fact that their uh payment has been received and processed then you know, it takes time for us to finish. It says one to two weeks, but that's like on the far end. That's, that's the maximum amount of time that it takes. Although it is just me right now running the business, I am looking for other artists who specialize in art that I don't necessarily specialize in. And then after that, we ship it out and they get their product. This is our financial model. This is a very roughly based financial model and all of the prices like the unit the unit revenue price that is based off competitive com the competitive price. We want our prices to be customer value based because I found that customers the way that I charge customers often find that their price is kind of low. They'd be like that's kind of low. You guys you should jack up the price a little bit. So for streetwear for customers Customizable streetwear, the base price to get anything customized is going to start at $50, and it could go to the far end to about $175, even $200, if they want a lot of things on their streetwear. The materials, including paint, patches, the heat transfer sheets, even the ink for the printer, those things run from about $5 to $20. And then labor, it only takes me uh, truly like two hours at $10 an hour is $20. So the unit gross profit could be anywhere between five to one hundred and thirty dollars, and the gross the gross margin is anywhere between five percent to twenty six percent. But once again, I am working on getting my prices to be customer based, which I will figure out those prices through surveys. But I'll get to that later on in the PowerPoint. Um, our restoration sneakers. We through our business, we like to go out and find sneakers that are beaten up and broken down. We like to bring them in, sanitize them, restore them. Like we'll take a a shoe that looks like this. I don't know if you guys can see it. It's really beat up and kind of ugly. And then we turn it into something like this, which looks practically brand new. Honestly. And it can cost all of our, this pair of shoes, I bought this for literally $2. Literally $2, no tax. And I would sell it for $125 on my website. For the materials to customize it, be paint, brushes, you know, finisher, cleaner, cleaner for the shoe to sanitize them, that'll be about $20. And then labor, it, it took me about five hours. And on average, it takes me about five hours to finish and to clean and restore and finish a pair of shoes. And that'll be about $40 at eight hour, eight, eight dollars an hour, which the unit goes profit will be about $65. And that is over 50% profit. But considering how I bought these for like $2 and I'll sell them for $125, that's over 100% profit. And that'll have to be our time. So let's transition to judges. We have three minutes for Q&A. Quick, I was gonna say, I love your enthusiasm. By the way, that's awesome. It's always, um, it's always fun to see somebody getting started on one of these projects if you can tell they really wanna do it. Um, 
So kudos to you on that. I was going to ask, uh, and, and you might have been getting to this and later on in your presentation, do you have anybody helping you at the moment? Do you have like a business partner, or just um, a friend who's also um, kind of coming on to, to help you work up and flesh out this idea? Actually, I actually do have a business partner, but they're more so into like drawing. So I'm, I would have to teach them the certain processes to use to get their paint onto a shoe because it's not just opening paint and then painting the shoe. It's a process that you have to go through. Right. So I'm working on teaching them that process, but yes, I do. Okay, perfect. And have y'all actually uh, created any samples and gotten any feedback from customers? Yes, we do. We actually have a few samples. I have a few samples here. This is a sample. I have these samples. These are Black History Month samples. I don't know if you guys can see very well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've seen those look great. We have these. These is another sample. And yeah, there, there are tons more, but I didn't kind of have enough space in front of me to hold all of the shoes. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm glad I asked if they were right there in front of you, too. So thank you. Thank you for showing me. That's awesome. How specialized is the labor that you're using on this like you're you're doing this art but is this something you can hand off to you know uh, 15 other people or are you gonna have to really train them uh, how specialized is the work you're needing to do to do the customization well the uh, i'm working on actually breaking like making the processes way because they're not hard processes like for example the heat press process it's not that hard you just put the put the clothes on the heat press you put something over it and then you press it yes they're honestly aren't that hard i think that um customizing shoes would be like one of the more harder ones but it's not hard at all either what's your uh oh sorry no 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 please uh so i guess what's your plan to like try and scale this you know um I know it's like a highly customized uh, product, but like, you know, when you're expanding, kind of like, what, are, what, what vision do you have? Well, um, actually, I would, I would like to order all of the apparel, like to have inventory. That way, if anyone wants to order, I can just take what I already have and then use the, use the product, use the garment that they would like. Um, also, I plan on using like social media also to like scale my business. I didn't get a chance to get to that in the PowerPoint, but I also plan on using social media a lot because I actually have like following. I have a following on social media where people are aware that I make custom and are aware of the business. So yeah, I think I'll use those two pretty much as like my main way of scaling the business and kind of keep pretty much keeping those processes down to a science because those processes are the main thing with the business. All right, last and, question. Yes, uh, so you mentioned the samples. Have you sold these already in terms of any of the samples that you've actually sold? And I apologize if I missed that. Yes, no, yes, I ha actually have sold some samples, but they were more so like to start off to see how people would like them. So I didn't charge an arm and a leg and they were, it was their own shoes. They just gave me their own shoes to customize and I charged them for the materials that I use, like the paint and the finisher and the cleaner and stuff like that. But I actually have sold a couple of um, shoes and I'm working on getting um, the equipment to sell like hoodies and shirts and hats and all of those things. Cool. All right. Thank you very much. Good presentation. And it looks like, unless I'm overlooking anyone, this will be our last presentation. So what we're going to do next is we are going to take the judges into a breakout room here in Zoom. Presenters, you'll get to stay in the main lobby, so to speak, here. And we'll be, uh, we'll be back in just a few minutes with the results and announcing the uh, winners of the uh, 2022 Best Brand Competition. So we'll be back in just a moment.
think our students may be stuck here in the breakout room, but we'll probably need to just wrap this up. Eric, do you think it's worth just sending out notifications to them? Oh, no, here we go. Here, we're coming back now. All right, let's see. Okay, folks, welcome back. I am sorry, we are going to have to very expediently finish this up. We have a tornado warning going on in Starkville here. So uh, teams, our judges were able to make a quick decision. Uh, although there was a, some hearty discussion before we had the tornado warning. Um, judges, again, thank you for joining us here. We really appreciate your time tonight and your tough decision. So um, third place award will be going to Calicia Moore. Congratulations on the third place win there. Second place will be the Mississippi Hat Co. Chris Knowles, congratulations on your uh, second place win there. And finally, first and uh, uh, certainly not least, first place will be going to Brook Bain tonight with, uh, with uh, Brooks, Brooks Botanicals. So Brooke, congratulations. And I believe, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight. Yes, so I believe the People's Choice will be awarded to Brooke Bain as well. So congratulations, folks. Those of you in Starkville, go find a safe spot. Thanks for joining. Tony, Anna, Jonathan, thank you so much as well. Brooke, congratulations. We'll be sure to... Uh, Get all of you your big checks too in Starkville um, <laughs> here after we get past the current situation. Thank you all. Have a good rest of your evening. Yeah, thank you guys. Congrats, to everybody. Congrats. Hello. Hello. I'm glad we survived the NATO just now, <laughs> or I guess non-existent tornado. Woo, well, it is raining hard too. So we, uh, the poor last competition, we were just finishing judging deliberation when the sirens went off. So, oh man. We were able to throw out the announcements of the winners really quick, and then everybody dove off. So, hey Eric, hey everybody, hey man, I like your fancy office. Yeah, you like this? Oh, is that my Wi-Fi? Is my Wi-Fi cutting out? Seems okay on this side. Okay, it's pretty crappy. So if it does, I I apologize.
Oke, ada.
Okay, folks, good evening and welcome to Startup Summit 2022 as we continue with our new product two division. And uh, we are joining broadcasting from Starkville and not in person, unfortunately, because we've had just the worst weather this evening. Um, our last competition was actually nearly cut short and uh, we, we didn't really get to give the sufficient honors to the awardees because uh, a tornado warning came up in Starkville. So here we are, we're getting rained on, hopefully no more tornadoes for the time being, but welcome. So tonight we're joined by some fantastic judges. And before we get into that, uh, this competition is for companies that have developed a new product idea. It's, uh, it's a, it, they've made some headway on it, but it's not quite, uh, not quite to the point of where there's a customer ready prototype. Uh, so that's where the teams are tonight presenting. So uh, going to our judges, I'm going to let them introduce themselves. And, um, and so we'll start with Mr. Tony Jeff from Innovate Mississippi. Hi, right, well, thank you. I'm excited to be here. I'm with Innovate Mississippi, and we work with early stage innovation and technology companies all over the state. And uh, a Mississippi State graduate, so excited to be a part of this. Thank you, Tony. Appreciate you being here tonight. And next, we'll go to Ms. Shelby Baldwin. All right. Hey, I'm Shelby. Um, I'm the co-founder of Buzzbassiter. We actually came out of the Mississippi State East Center. I graduated in 2019, and Buzzbassiter was launched in 2020, but we started building it in 2019, while I and Calvin, one of my co-founders, uh, were still in school. So excited to be here, excited to see what the East Center and Mississippi State students are working on nowadays. <laughs> Yep. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Eric, cut you off. Calvin Wadi, uh, super excited to be here. I was in your shoes um, and still am in some instances. So super excited to hear what you guys have and uh, look forward to to some awesome, some awesome products and businesses. Thank you. Awesome. And um Shelby and Calvin, I believe in 2019 or 2020, no, 2020, we canceled 19. You all won this competition and they now work full time for their business. that is well on its way to being a huge success. So uh, just keep that in mind as you're presenting it tonight. You never know where uh, even this one action that you're taking on a rainy night can lead to because uh, it can lead to something great. So. Um, some housekeeping tonight. We have, first of all, a People's Choice Award that we'll be awarding. We do encourage you to go to the Startup Summit website, ecenter.msstate.edu slash summit, find the YouTube feed, and your vote will be your comment in the, in the live stream of the YouTube feed. So make sure you invite your friends to come watch and vote on the $250 People's Choice We'll also be awarding other prizes tonight. First prize will be $2,500, second prize $1,000, third prize, third prize $500. And the judges, of course, have the tough decision of making, uh, making that choice tonight. Um, and those awards would not be possible without some seriously generous alumni and contributions from friends of the Entrepreneurship Center. But please go to our website, check out, um, check out those individuals that make this possible because they literally are funding the future. Um, so special thanks to Banktel Systems, J5 Global, Industry Services Co., and Read Food Technologies uh, for uh, underwriting this, and this event and all the other great competitions this week. So without further ado, uh, some logistics. Each team will have five minutes to present and three minutes for Q&A. And yes, I get to be the bad guy and cut you off. So please keep track of your time somewhere um, and make sure that you're sticking to the timeline. Um, Q&A is reserved just for the judges. So um, let's everybody else who's waiting to present, please just keep your mic on mute and your camera off while the others are presenting. All right, and with that, we will go to our first team tonight, which is Diversified Food Solutions. So Sawyer, whenever you're ready, feel free to share your screen and take it away. That sounds good. So hello everyone, I am Sawyer Wyatt Smith. I am the founder of Diversified Food Solutions. We are a company that can provide scientifically sound products, advising, and solutions suited to any 
food processor. I have a picture of apples back here, but that's not exactly what we'll talk about tonight. So tonight, my main focus is our new product, a sustainable food grade coating, also biodegradable slash edible film. The team consists of me, Lizzie Zaldivar, Dr. Wes Schilling, and the Muscle Foods and Sensory Laboratory. I am more or less a representative of the Muscle Foods and Sensory Laboratory here tonight. We are working in unison, Diversified Food Solutions and the lab. So here's a picture of the globe. What does this have to do with me? So I'm a food company, right? So this picture was sourced from NASA. It was took in 2001. This is the picture of the depleting ozone layer back in 01. So the depleting ozone layer, I'm not going to pretend like I'm an expert on the subject matter. However, we all know that this is an issue that affects us here today and that government agencies are trying effortlessly to try to halt this. So what does this have to do with me once again? This is a perfect example of how astronomical events affect us here on the ground, even our food supply. So there is a chemical called methyl bromide, which was used by dried cured ham industries. Dried cured ham is a product mainly made in the southeastern United States, but it is made all over the world, including Europe. So mainly in Europe, actually. So methyl bromide was used to fumigate these houses to kill these things, ham mites, also in the scientific name, Tyrophagus putrescente. These things really love dry cured hams. The conditions are perfect for them. The humidity, the temperature, the salt, they love it. They can't wait to eat it. So, but this is considered a zero tolerance pest by the USDA. Even if you have one of these on your ham, you can't sell it, you can't eat it, you can't sell it to somebody and let them wash it off, you have to dispose of it. You cannot sell it. And the dry cured ham industry is not a big one. So they cannot afford much loss. Right now, since methyl bromide was phased out, it is illegal to use now except your current supplies and then it will be phased out due to the ozone depletion. So they have to rely on ham nets. Right now, when the dry cured, when these ham mites see a ham, they look like this. They're saying, honey, go get the kids. We're going to go eat dinner tonight. It is wonderful. They love the dry cured hams. But the goal of Diversified Food Solutions is to turn this cute face into, oh, Neptune, we don't know what to eat anymore. We can't eat dry cured hams. We want them to think this. So Diversified Food Solutions has developed this plastic right here. This is an edible film. And it would be coated around hams just like a candy wrapper. These dry cured hams are, this is a very small sample, but the dry cured hams are about this big. So they will require a lot more plastic. So let's go to the cost. So the cost of these things, this is me working in the lab on the plastic actually. So the cost is between our cheapest is half a penny to $1.50. Right now, ham producers don't want to spend $3 on a coated net. Our lab has worked with an active ingredient that has been proven to kill these ham mites and reduce their numbers. Our active ingredient is still present in these films, but it is much cheaper. There is an initial investment of processing equipment such as shearing to mix it up and to pump equipment so we must dry it. It has, requires a particular environment, just a 50% humidity, room temperature, um, stabilized. So there is less labor costs to make this plastic versus the ham net. It is simple to make and it is quick. This took about 30 minutes. The ham nets may take around seven hours. However, it is not as durable as the nets, but it is still pretty durable. You can't hang a ham in it right now and that's what the nets do, but diversified food solutions with future formulations can change this with no problem. So our market plan, we work very closely with the Jack Your Ham industry and we know their needs and this is why we come up with the solution in the first place. So the plastic can be used to supplement the current coated nets, which have been proven to work. However, they're expensive. The ham producers don't want to spend even $3. That might not sound like a lot, but they're not a big industry. They can't afford to spend that much money on each ham. It could be a supplement to uncoated nets, which have no solution on them. Reduce the numbers, but don't work quite as good. This plastic could be the active ingredient. It is also a possible alternative coating altogether and can be used for other food products and cosmetic products such as breath mints. So I hope you enjoyed and I'm open to any questions. Yeah, thanks, Sawyer. This is Tony Jeff. Is this in any of this technology university owned that you will have to license or is this yeah. something that you, your team has developed on its own? So we work 
I am in the muscle foods and sensory laboratory, which is a university product. So we actually have licensed um, ha- or patented the ham nets of which I mentioned earlier and have been patented. So we are on the track to patenting this. So it is a university owned project um, piece of property, but I can't state the formulation obviously because it's, it's intellectual property. So I can't give that up right now. But your team does not have the license to this technology. Currently the university hasn't licensed that yet, I'm assuming. Not currently. Uh, quick question. You said that it had been tested. Um, so I was trying to figure out based on a, a number of just 100 bugs, how many were actually killed? Because I don't know if you said it, you said the percentage. I'm sorry, I missed it. But Oh, no, that's, that's a good question. So we have done numerous, there's been numerous um, academic papers published. How they do it is they inoculate 20 mites onto each um, cube. And remember, there's a zero tolerance. They can't even have one. So yeah. after two weeks, we look at the ham cubes once again, like that picture of me looking through the microscope, and we'll count them. And if the numbers, some numbers are usually for this plastic around zero, zero to two, that means a serious reduction. They are no longer reproducing, which is exactly what the ham producers are looking for. I have a question. So I know you mentioned that the dry cured ham industry is not very big. So what is the market size for this? Like talk, talk a little bit about revenue or kind of like, you know, what, what do you think you can, how many people you think you can sell this to um, and who you're selling to exactly? Cause I'm not sure if I missed that or not. Yes. A good question. The, well, who would we sell this to is the dry cured ham producers directly. This wouldn't be a consumer product because we have to combat the mites at the, at the facility. And the market size for this, it's mainly in the Southeast of the United States, but I can't speak for Europe. Um, but usually I don't know the exact numbers, so I won't, I can't say that, but the market size, it is not as big as what they call city hams, which is hams not hung and put, put salt on the outside. That means they must be injected for preservative uses. So I can't say the exact size, but I do know for a fact, it is not a big industry. Many people don't even know what a dry cured ham is. But these producers, this is the first step to getting it, getting it well known. I have one more question, unless Tony has one. No, no, please do it. So, excuse me if I sound ignorant. So, plastic, you have the plastic and then you have the, the nets that they were usually in, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So, what is the, uh, and you might have said this, but what is the uh, environmental implications of the plastic? You know, I think you mentioned the ozone layer, you know, so I'm just wondering what, what is the plan behind that? So another great question. So the nets are single use. They are made of textile, made of textiles, maybe somewhat like cotton. But this plastic, although I can't say the exact ingredients, you can eat this. I can eat this. I have eaten can, this. Okay. So it, anything that is um, edible is also biodegradable. And um, this is this actually the thing about this. You can put water on it. You spray it with a water bottle. It comes right off. So if you gave that ham that was wrapped in plastic to a consumer, put it under the sink, comes right off. And if you get gotcha. some, you can, you can eat it. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and now that you say that, yeah, I do recall you saying that at the beginning part. I just missed it. So, yeah, very good. Very good. Yes, thank you. And that will have to be our last question. Thank you so much, Sawyer. Appreciate your presentation. Great job. Thank you. Yep. All right. And next up, we'll be going to Woody Watson with the can sealer. Woody, whenever you're ready, feel free to turn on your camera mic and share your slides. All right, can everybody see everything okay? We've got you, yes, sir. All right, hey everyone, I'm Woody Watson. I'm here to tell you about can sealer, creating a solution that keeps your can beverage cold, secure, and discreet. Now, the picture you see on the top left is not the prototype that I'm here to tell you about tonight. It's actually the rudimentary design that I made whenever I had this idea. So problem. Many people enjoy drinking their beer or seltzer from the can, but cans are not appropriate in all circumstances. The common solution is to use a red solo cup or a styrofoam cup, but that does not keep your drink cold and there's negative connotations with red solo cups around drunken partying and that and red solo cups take around 12 years to decompose in a landfill and styrofoam takes around 200. When you transfer a canned drink into a cup, 
the drink will go flat a lot sooner and there's almost a hundred percent chance that dirt or insects will find their way into your drink. And the picture you see on the right is me and my friends in the junction using cups because we don't have any alternatives. Solution, can sealer will be a sleeve that fits around your can and goes into your cup. It will come with a cup and straw of its own and will be able to fit into multiple large size cups that you can get from fast food restaurants. The cooling sleeve will be topped with a layer of fake ice that will keep your drink cold and discreet. Now here's how it works. First, you take your beverage and you open it. You get the sleeve, you line up this hole with the hole right here. Stick it in. Drop it into your cup. I have a chick fil cup here. Stick your straw in. And you're ready to go. The next stage for can sealer will be obtaining a design patent. Customer, market research suggests that can sealer will be primarily for young adults ages 21 to 25, specifically for women. And this is because women typically prefer straws more than men do, and especially when drinking seltzers. Many guys that I've talked to voice concerns about drinking beer out of a straw and how they might not like it. I will say around 40% of those that I've talked to said it would not be preferred, but it would not be the worst because of the added discretion. Focus groups suggest that they would use it while going to the district, the beach, pool, concerts, and tailgates. There is interest in the product as well. Out of a survey of 132 people, 54% said they would be interested in purchasing the product for themselves, and 68% said that they knew someone who they would purchase it for. The business model. Rough estimates from KC Interactive, who has done the initial prototype, indicate that after an initial setup cost, an order of around 10,000 units would cost about $5 per unit. But that is without accounting for materials and transportation. So more realistically, around $7. Market research has suggested that consumers would pay between $10 and $20 for the product. So the current target price is $15. If we were to have an order of 10,000 units that cost $7 to make and we charge 15, the profit would be $80,000. Once we attain a design patent, communication manufacturers can begin so that more accurate estimates can be attained and more accurate profit margins can be determined. The sales and marketing strategy. CanSeal will reach its customers in advertisements on platforms such as Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. The advertisements will come in two forms, college age, quote unquote, influencers showing off their CanSealer in action and dedicated CanSealer accounts showing off the technology and how it works. It will be sold through direct web sales initially and hopefully sold in retail stores such as Reed's and Dick's Sporting Goods. Competition and competitive advantage. Yeti and Arctic, as you see on the top right, make, things, make products that keep your can cold, but not necessarily discreet. Beersy, who is the sleeve you see in the middle, they make sleeves that go around your can, but they don't keep them cold and they're very, not very discreet. You can typically tell what's actually inside of it. Trinkin, which you see on the bottom right, is it makes a coffee cup that goes around your can, but it does not keep your drink cold and it does not have the best aesthetic. Also, none of these have straws. Can sealer will be the best of both worlds, keeping your drink cold and concealed while having a stylish design for the base cup. It will be versatile being able to use a variety of straws that all you'd have to do is cut, cut them and stick them in, and the sleeve will fit into multiple cups. And it will have a cooling sleeve, a layer of fake ice, keeping your drink cold and discreet. So please join me on my journey to keep your canned beverage in the can where it belongs, no matter where you are. Thank you. Any questions? Great job, Woody. I do have a, well, first, let me just say, um, I think someone, I spoke at Eric's um, entrepreneurship class the other day, and someone came in and asked the students some questions about this product. And I remember everyone in the class hands went up and said they were interested. So I actually remember this from that, but I did want to ask a question. Um, I know at the beginning you said one of the problems you're trying to solve is that, you know, styrofoam cups take 200 years or so, I think it was 200 years to decompose. I might be wrong on the time frame on that, but then I saw yes, that, that's all right. you know, yeah, all the prototypes of you showing it was like inside a styrofoam Chick-fil-A cup. So I guess what I'm trying to figure out is, and the research that you've done, like with potential customers, do people say that they would buy a styrofoam cup, like a Chick-fil-A cup specifically to put this in? Because if so, I guess it wouldn't really be reducing the problem. Or do you think people would just put it in a cup they already have? 
So what we're going for right now is there will be a plastic base cup that comes with it. I actually planned on having one tonight. I was at the idea shop last night, 3D printing one, but I was unable to get it because of the storm today. But the way I view the styrofoam cups is like this Chick-fil-A cup, I got it this morning. People are going to have it anyway. They wouldn't be going out and buying a new one. So this is just giving more use to a cup that someone already has. Yeah, and that, that's what I figured. I didn't want to ask. I think it'd be great in the future to consider adding a cup to the prototype that comes with it. I know you said you kind of were working on that, um, but something that maybe looks like a fast food cup, but actually is reusable and not as, you know, I don't know the opposite, the word for the opposite of durable, I guess, fragile as a Chick-fil-A, like regular fast food cup, something that you can use for a long time. That'd be my one piece of feedback, but great presentation. Thank you. So I'm curious, the design patent option versus a utility patent that would protect better. Uh, obviously, it's pretty easy to get around the design patent uh, sometimes because you can change small design elements. Uh, is What is the patent landscape in terms of competitors or other utility patents that are out there that are making you go the design patent route? Uh, I will be honest, I'm not entirely sure. This is on, this is advice that I've been given from the MBA team. They said that getting a utility patent, at least initially, would be extremely difficult and they would advise going for a design patent first. I have a quick question. <clears throat> I know one of the benefits is it's a concealer, kind of gives you some privacy to your drinks, but if you're targeting a 25 or 21 to 25, I think it was, you know, if I'm at the beach, you know, if I'm 26, 27, getting the product, do I really care about it being concealed? I like the aspect that it keeps the, the cool coat, uh, the drink cold, excuse me. But uh, I'm just curious to know, like with the target market, you know, what is the draw to the concealer aspect? Part of what we're going for is eliminating the need for being judged, especially if like, for example, going to like a nephew's birthday party, the mom might not be cool with you drinking, but that would definitely make the party a lot more fun for yourself. And I've also seen multiple videos of people on beaches who are getting in trouble for having uh, beers out there. And so this would be trying to decrease that happening. And, and is a plan for the lid, the first lid, is it going to be the, with the coolant? Is that going to be a washable product you then would put in the freezer or something to have it cold when you reapply? Yes, sir, you would put it in the freezer. That'll have to be our last question. What do you thank you very much for your presentation tonight? Thank you. Thanks. All right. Next up, I believe we have Be Creative Energy. Emiliano, are you presenting? Feel free to um, turn on your camera and share your slides. Um, oh, my camera doesn't seem to be working. No problem. Okay, um, I'll go ahead and start. Sorry about that. No problem. Oh, I got it. Hi, right. good. We're good now. <laughs> good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Emiliano Estrada, and my teammates are Colby Freeman and Ben Gibbons, and we are Be Creative Energy. We are seniors studying biological engineering, and as biological engineers, we believe that we must play a leading role in the efforts to move towards a more sustainable future. Now, what if I told you that we have many different uses for landfill waste, a low-value feedstock, that we can use to create high value products as part of a resilient bio refinery. The problems we solve range from increasing waste in landfills, causing man waste management companies to relocate, emissions that are created through the production of hydrogen, and increasing demand for carbon dioxide removal as companies look to seek to reduce their emissions in light of shearwater pressure and atmospheric conditions. 
Recycled waste was previously exported overseas up until 2017. As of 2018, foreign countries such as China and Indonesia announced that they would no longer accept plastic waste from the U.S. Millions of tons of plastic waste left a millions of tons of plastic waste to be stuck in landfills at home. Specifically, 19,000 shipping containers of recycled waste per month were previously exported overseas. This waste is now being put into waste energy systems that are incinerated incinerate the plastic waste, resulting in excessive amounts of carbon dioxide and methane. By utilization of the waste with our technology, we can preserve the location of the landfill, reducing exposure of waste to other locations and biosystems. As hydrogen is produced, carbon dioxide is also naturally produced. For every 1 million tons of standard cubic feet of hydrogen produced, 13 million metric tons of carbon dioxide is released. We are unique in the sense that we make use of the hydrogen and carbon dioxide that is produced. Companies are consistently being pressured by shareholders to reduce their carbon footprint, thus increasing the demand for carbon removal projects. Activist investors and government agencies such as the Department of Energy are the lead investors for carbon removal technology, supplying a total of $21 million to projects aiming at reversing emissions. Now I would like to outline um, a little bit of how our solution works. Um, the basis of it is taking advantage of this landfill waste and using both the energy and the actual matter of it um, in our process. So we, we would like to see a setup where we are located near a landfill um, and we are taking that incoming uh, stream of, of waste, whether it's municipal solid waste from residential commercial applications, um, sorting it, uh, we want to separate out dry waste, things like paper, plastic, and wood um, from the wet organic waste, things like food waste, um, and then inorganic waste, things like metals that can't go through these uh, biological or thermochemical conversions. Those get sent back to the landfill. The dry waste goes through a process called gasification, producing syngas and heat, and the wet waste goes through a process called anaerobic digestion, that produces methane and CO2. Um, since we are near a landfill, we will also have a stream of methane and CO2 coming from the landfill as landfill gas. Uh, this will be fed in with the gas coming from the anaerobic digestion and cleaned and go through a process called dry methane reforming that also produces syngas. Now from this step, we can take that syngas and go through a water gas shift reaction to get uh, just CO2 and H2 and then go through a CO2 separation uh, process. This is the uh, main advantage of our company that we see. This is a technology that is in development in a lab here at Mississippi State um, using some funding that we got for this idea. Um, and the CO2 can be used for sequestration and durable products. And the H2 has markets in oil refining, ammonia, and steel. So for our Overall business model, um, as you can see from the, our previous slide, there's a lot of different potential revenue streams, um, whether it's through the CO2 utilization in durable products, um, the hydrogen that is being produced and the energy and value of that, uh, the carbon credits that we can provide to businesses, um, or even the waste offtake. Uh, there can be some value in that depending on the waste that we are taking in. Um, our expenses are going to be mainly the capital expenses of putting this equipment and technology in place and operating expenses from labor and some energy needs on things like sorters and um, fans for moving the air through the system. And catalysts and absorbents are uh, semi-durable products that are only going to last maybe three or four years in the system before they will need to be replenished. For our marketing strategy, we plan on targeting firms and uh, businesses that are looking to become either carbon neutral or carbon negative. And we will also establish key partnerships with waste management companies. Um, the advantages that we have is that we're, we're currently researching the, a, a new method for separating carbon from syngas under the supervision of Dr. Yu and Dr. Amin. And the other advantage is that uh, we can use any type of waste feedstock or biomass feedstock, and we can also combine them to improve the quality of our syngas. And that's everything. Thank you.
All right, great job. Uh, just a question on the the cost of the the new technology that you guys are building at Mississippi State. Do you guys have that number or know the number of that? We do not have the uh, current number on that. Um, we are, I would say, fairly early on the technology readiness level with the okay. technology we're looking at. Um, somewhere at a three or four. It's based on some simulations that have been done, some process simulations. Um, and we're looking to demonstrate that in the lab and uh, get a better number on the exact cost. But I, I think techno-economic analysis that's been done on similar processes put the cost of carbon at um, somewhere around $100 per ton. Um, large range around that. There's a lot of different processes, but sure. Uh, that's that's not considering all of the, the value of all the other products. So once we get that number, we can really have a good idea of the cost. And if assuming the separation works as designed, how much of this is taking existing methane venting from existing landfills versus the new processing of municipal solid waste? I mean, you could basically apply this directly to the existing methane vents and in landfills, could you not, what, relatively speaking, which of those two sides is more interesting or more, you know, a bigger percentage of what you're producing? Right, so the taking the landfill gas is something that um, I think is already done at a lot of different, a lot of the landfills. Um, so as far as what the percentage is that we want to do, um, it's really going to be dependent on the waste availability. Uh, but as far as the climate impact, that's what we're all really interested in personally. And I think that you can have a bigger climate impact by increasing the amount that goes through the gasification route and even starting to bring in um, biomass sources and bringing in biogenic CO2 and having the opportunity to be uh, carbon negative and taking emissions out of the atmosphere. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, yes. Do you guys have, uh, this is very broad, but just in your research, have a, uh, a number or kind of a target for the, for the companies that are carbon negative or are, are trying to achieve being carbon negative just in research? Like the amount of companies that are trying to be carbon negative? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just curious, you know, to see, uh, as I know it's, it's a big deal, a big thing that people are interested in, but I, I heard you say that you'd be targeting. Can you go back to this slide um, where you're talking about here? So um, I, don't, I don't know if you're familiar with the carbon market. So the government sets uh, a cap on the amount of emissions that companies are allowed to emit. If they exceed that cap, then they have the option to buy carbon credits from other companies. And that, that's where we come in. Yeah, that's a very established market. And then um, we're, we're seeing some growth in companies that are wanting to go all the way to all the way to zero beyond the government requirements. Um, companies like uh, Stripe and Microsoft are making investments in carbon removal firms in order to do that. Cool. That will have to be our last question. Folks, thanks for your presentation. Well done. Thanks for your questions. Thank you. Good job. And next up, we have Liam Nelson's. So feel free to share your slides and uh, take it away whenever you're ready. Thank you. Give me one second. All right. Can everyone see this okay? We can, yes. Great. Okay. So let me introduce you to REMS. So REMS is, stands for Residential Energy Management System. So a big problem today, and this is a very generalized problem, is we have fossil fuel power plants that run on fossil fuels and they generate a lot of CO2 emissions. And there is a lot of work being done on the supply side with solar, battery storage, wind turbines, Etc. However, those are intermittent and they don't last forever. 
So other solutions are needed in order to balance out that intermittency. And that is where REMS, demand response, comes in. What REMS does is it allows customers or homeowners to participate in the energy transition directly. First, it tracks each individual load, such as temperature, hot water, electric vehicle charging, washer, et cetera. And then it takes a demand response event from the utility or system operator, and then it can adequately plan for that event by either preheating or pre-cooling the home, preheating hot water, pre-charging your car, everything that has to do, it automatically does that prior. And then once that demand response event comes in and you get that alert, then you, all, all of a sudden your energy is reduced. You don't notice it's reduced and you are making money. So first let me give a baseline of how this process works. Traditionally, the utility will sell directly to the homeowner via a bilateral transaction. The utility produces the energy, the homeowner buys the energy. It's that simple. Now, ever since the early 2000s, there's competition. Grid operators are nonprofits and they operate the grid and that introduced energy markets. And then now utilities are, if they want to participate in this energy market and utilize its cost savings, they have to compete. So this allows homeowners to pick what energy is the cheapest based on where they are. And this is where REMS comes in. REMS allows you to bypass that interaction with the utility directly and interface directly with the grid operator and bid in that demand that you are saving as supply to the grid. How does this work? Well, first, REMS will check to see, hey, do you want to turn off anything manually? Because the user is going to know what they want to turn off before anyone else does, or more than anyone else does. Once that's established, the user will then have the option to reduce their, their temperature set point. But because, like I mentioned earlier, the preheating, pre-cooling, if the demand response event is around an hour long, which most often they are, you will not even realize a temperature difference. The next step is hot water. If you can notice the demand response event prior, which usually they come in three days prior, give or take, you can then reduce or increase the preheating of your hot water heater, meaning that it won't try to preheat during the event. So now let's look at the market of this product. So the existing capability in the US is around 59 gigawatts, which is a lot of demand response. However, that is only in emergency situations. Most grid operators are not su suited to handle constant transactions back and forth with residential customers. However, a lot of the grid operators are currently going through a process of implementing this technology because FERC, the organi organization that reg regulates the grid operators is now forcing them to allow residential customers to participate. This means that there will probably be a 4X increase in the amount of capacity of demand response and you will make far more money with participating in this market than you would today. So now let's talk about how it's traditionally done. MISO is a grid operator. The home is a home. You only are allowed to do it in emergency uses. MISO has not used their energy since 2000, their demand response since 2006. Now in 2030, MISO will release a platform that allows homes to directly participate as long as they're aggregated to a certain megawatt scale. Similarly, NLX, think of that as REMS, and AMO, think of that as MISO. NLX has participated in the market, and they are about to 10x their generation. So now I want to go into the solar decathlon. We are implementing a prototype into the solar decathlon build challenge, and it will be built in 2023 in collaboration with Four County and TVA. Thank you, everyone. I'm happy to field any questions. So what do you see? Are there competitive systems that are pushed on these demand response type of um, environments? What, what do you see in terms of competitive management systems on the demand side? 
Yes. So there's a company called Ohm Connect in California that has successfully done this, and they're actually doing it in a fantastically successful way. However, their relationship is with California ISO, and they are not targeting the MISO market because the California ISO is about five years ahead of the MISO market. And I specifically intend to target the MISO market because I currently work there and I'm working on the tool that is being developed to allow these homes to participate. I'm gonna be honest with you. A lot of this is right here for me, but it <laughs> seems like you guys, um, seems like you, you, you got something good here. Um, I don't know if Shelby has a question, but great presentation. <laughs> Yeah, I second what Calvin said. I'm really trying to follow you, but you know, my world is social media and influencers. So this is like way over my head. So I just want to ask a clarification question. So the when you say demand response, I was trying to understand exactly what yeah. that means. From what I got from what I gather, it's like you said it's something you can know about three days in advance. So is it yes, is it weather? Like explain that a little yeah. bit. So basically the utility uh, has demand and supply you know, think of a demand and the supply curve, right? So the utility has those projections. However, sometimes during the summer when it's really hot, everyone's turning on their AC. All of a sudden load is much higher than supply and they need to find a way to deal with that. And traditionally what they do is they turn on these super dirty plants and just leave them idle, you know, consuming fuel, leaving them idle. And then, but this allows them to turn off and decommission those plants entirely and by allowing um, the customers the load to participate by reducing their load at plan times. And RIMS would take on that financial risk of them not participating. And I do wanna just throw this in, TVA and Four County are very heavily involved in this process uh, in the solar decathlon prototype. Um, we are currently working with several engineers from both of their um, companies and trying to get a plan figured out for what works best for everyone. I had a, okay. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Calvin. No, just a question about that. So, what is the um, what does the split split look like for ownership? Is it, you know, is it split between the partners, or are they just participating, um, you know, on the engineering side, and, and there's compensation for that? What, what does that look like? So, yes. So their compensation. So, basically, this is my project in a sense, um, and the these people are on board, and we've talked about the compensation stuff, but I'd prefer not to disclose that if that's okay. Uh, yeah, so. sure. Well, from yeah. your revenue side, how does that work for, are you selling this in through the utility or are you selling this to consumers? And then that, uh, how do you do that from your revenue side do you envision? Yeah, so because the utility owns the, the transmission, we have to work with them, but we do not have to, I guess, in a sense, compete with their generation. So. Um, basically it's going to help the utility because it reduces their peak loads, like I mentioned earlier. Um, but, um, well, sorry, what I, I mean though, is are you selling this to consumers or are you selling this to uh, yes. TVA? Okay. Yeah. Well, there, so yeah, sorry. How this works is TVA, uh, theoretically will, um, and this is how Ohm, Ohm Connect's process works. So TVA will have a generation plant. And then if they can reduce a certain amount of demand through RIMS, then they can turn off that generation plant instead of keeping it running. And the cost savings from turning off that generation plant goes directly to RIMS, which is then distributed out among its um, around among the homes that participated in that event who committed that demand response. Does that that will sense? have to be our last question. Okay. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. All right, so we have had our four teams present here tonight, and we are now going to take the judges into a virtual breakout room for deliberation. Teams, you'll be joined into one room. Those of you joining us live will be back shortly. Be sure to go on the YouTube chat uh, live stream and vote for your people's choice. We'll tally those at the end here and uh, make sure to award that prize. So we'll be back shortly.
Okay, we're waiting for the last remaining participants to come back here. Okay, folks, welcome back. I believe we have everyone with us here. I was uh, just reviewing the very hot people's choice going on on the YouTube chat. So thanks everyone for joining in and um, supporting your teams. Uh, before we announce the awards, uh, first I wanna thank the judges again for joining us tonight, your time. And uh, they had a fairly lengthy deliberation because of the presentations being uh, so good. So. I know they were uh, appreciative of your pitches and I wanted to give them an opportunity to share some uh, observations they had about all four of the presentations. So I'm gonna look on my screen here and start with you, Shelby, on your overall thoughts for the evening. Yeah, first of all, I wanna say great job to everybody. Really enjoyed hearing everyone's presentations. As Eric said, it took us a while to deliberate um, and it was a really tough decision. And I just wanna say, you know, like Calvin kind of mentioned at the beginning and Eric, Calvin and I were in your exact shoes in this exact division, actually, at Startup Summit in 2019. And, you know, I remember all the nerves of getting the pitch together and practicing it and pitching it. And like the judges would ask questions and I would be all hurt that they didn't like my product or whatever, worried that they wouldn't like it. So I just want to know, I want you guys to know that I totally empathize with all of you on that. Um, but you did, you did great. And you know, if you don't come in first place, don't let it deter you. Everyone was so amazing. Just keep going. Um, the one piece of advice I'd have for everybody, especially because there were so many like really high tech um, products, very their industries, whether it was food or energy or, or food science, energy, different things, you know, keep in mind that when you're pitching to a panel of judges and not of the time not everyone is going to know what your industry is or about your industry or about the science or tech behind your product just make sure to dumb it down as much as possible i know that sounds a little insulting but like for me and calvin you know we're in e-commerce and social media and i know tony also you know he's in a bunch of different things and so when we were listening to some of the presentations and we were trying to when we were deliberating we were kind of like wait did we understand that right are we understanding how all this works so just keep in mind when you're creating your pitches, use really simple language, make sure that everybody can understand how it works. Um, that's my number one piece of feedback that I think kind of applied to a lot of the teams in this presentation. But overall, you guys did a great job. You should be super proud of yourselves. Keep it up. Don't give up. I have this thing behind me. Do or do not. There is no try. Um, keep going. Keep trying. Um, you guys are going to do great. So that's my feedback. Thank you, Shelby. Calvin, how about you? It's going to be tough to follow up that, but uh, yeah, everybody did a fantastic job. Um, yeah, uh, you guys are really, really smart. Some really cool products, businesses, I think, are going to be formed. Um, and you guys are laying that foundation. There can only be, obviously, a winner, but I think that you all, you guys all have a product that you should be proud of and that you should continue forward. Um, there's, in my entrepreneurial journey, there's been things that I've tried and, and heard a lot of no's, heard some yeses, uh, but the no's are what made me and fueled me to go forward. So don't be discouraged um, by anything that comes out tonight. You guys all are uh, fantastic and I'm super proud of what's coming out of Mississippi State um the entrepreneurship center and i appreciate you guys putting up with my my questions thank you calvin tony how about you yeah well first of all echo uh, my fellow judges i think first of all it makes me proud to be a bulldog and proud to see the continuing uh you know uh, companies that just keep uh, coming and coming and uh, mississippi state is a great place to be a startup, a startup founder, and so I'm excited to see these teams continuing like that. To, uh, to sort of echo, uh, the we, we're only seeing the, the narrowest. It's like we're looking in a window, and we you know, it's really the window that has blinds almost in terms of what we can really see about your business. We can see this tiniest little slice in five minutes. 
is not enough for us to have really been able to evaluate fully uh, what's going on here. So it could easily just be that we misunderstood some portion. So don't take that as, you know, that, uh, you know, it's a bad idea or anything like that, please, because uh, we're only looking at what we could see in that narrow window. But I was still very, very impressed. And that was a lot of the discussion was us asking other questions and in a 20 minute presentation, we would have gotten all the answers to, I'm sure. But these were great. And I'm just excited to participate. Also excited as much as I love being in Starkville. I don't have to drive home. So I appreciate you, Eric, letting me do this remotely as well. Absolutely. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Calvin. Thank you, Shelby. So the moment of truth, however, we have to award some prizes tonight. So we will start first with third place. And the third place award tonight is going to Can Sealer. Congratulations, Woody. Nice job. And uh, be sure to come by the E-Center. We'll make sure you get one of the giant big checks and uh, that way you can hang it on your wall as inspiration. Moving on to second place in the second place spot. This was hotly debated between one and two. I think they went back and forth, I don't know, two or three times. But the number two second place prize for $1,000 is going to Diversified Food. Congratulations. Good job, team. All right. And the first place, taking on the grand prize and going to the grand finale on Friday, that will be going to REMS. Congratulations. Well done. And finally, the people's choice, which I have to say, I was, I was totally blown away. I was telling the judges that it has been the fiercest competition tonight between Be Creative Energy and Diversified Food Solutions. And I was sticking it all in Excel and tracking, but one team was up, the other was down, one team was down, the other was up. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna award two People's Choice Awards tonight to Diversified Food Solutions and Be Creative Energy. Congratulations to both teams for rallying an amazing live audience uh, supporting you tonight. So good work to both teams. So thank you all for joining us. Those of you, uh, Consider looking at the rest of the week. We have three more competitions. Tomorrow night at 5.30, we'll have the brick and mortar division. At 7.15, we'll have our new product three. This is the, the most sophisticated of uh, products that we've had in the competition will be tomorrow night at 7.15. And of course, all the winners from the preceding rounds go on to the Bank Tell Grand Finale on Friday at four o'clock in McCool Hall on Starkville and we'll also be live streaming that as well. So we hope you'll consider joining us for that. Thanks again for joining tonight. Everybody having a good, good evening. Thank you. Bye everyone.